So I've started a series entitled, The Power of the Holy Spirit. And over the last two weeks, we have uh, been studying and looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. This morning, my message is entitled, Having Coffee with the Holy Spirit. Now, you might wonder, what the heck has coffee got to do with the Holy Spirit? Well, I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 14. And here, as Paul is coming to the conclusion of his writings, this is what he says. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have experienced the grace? All right. Grace is God's undeserved favor. We don't deserve it, but yet God loves us. He forgives us. He embraces us and receives us as his kids. And Paul says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have God's grace on your life? How many of you experience the love of God in your life? Paul says, I want you to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Now, I invite, over the years, I've watched my parents invite people over their home, and I've watched them entertain. When I was pioneering a church in Dubbo, New South Wales, Australia, uh, we would invite people over and have fellowship with them. And that always involved either making pizzas or lasagna or having a meal and sometimes just a cup of coffee. I remember one time we were pioneering this church in Dubbo and my son Robbie was only about four years old at the time. And someone knocked at our front door and as I get up to answer it, Robbie is right behind me. And as soon as I open the door, it was one of the guys from our church. His name was Robert also. And I'm shaking his hand saying, hi, how are you? And my little son looks up and says, tea, tea? <laughs> he was inviting him in for a cup of tea. In Australia, they do a lot more tea drinking than coffee drinking, at least back then. But the point is, Paul tells us to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We understand the grace that comes from Jesus Christ. We understand the love of God. But Paul literally says, I want you to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The word fellowship, have we got the screen? Here we go. The word fellowship in the Greek is the word kononia. Now, raise your hand if you've heard that word before, kononia, okay? This is a Greek word, and it means literally to have partnership with, contributory help, or participation. To have fellowship with the Holy Spirit means let him be your partner. Now, I got a question for you. If the Holy Spirit is literally going to come into your life, if you have a business, God wants the Holy Spirit to be a partner in your business. In the relationship of the Holy Spirit and us, who do you think the senior partner should be? The Holy Spirit. Absolutely. I'm preaching this today because so often we concentrate on God the Father. We concentrate on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And many of us visualize Jesus as he interacted with his disciples and lived with them and broke bread with them. And many of us talk to Jesus as if, and rightly so, he is here with us. But what we often neglect is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to have fellowship with us. And so I'm going to invite a couple of guys to come and have fellowship with me. Larry, you can't come and have the pizza, but come and have fellowship with me. All right? I want to invite you to the table. We've got fresh brewed coffee. If you would take a seat here. 
There you go. Give Larry a big hand as he comes. There you go. And Edgar, why don't you come on down the front? Edgar's been with us now for about three weeks. Is that right? Give Ed, Edgar a big round of applause. And I'm going to serve you guys coffee. <laughs> There's a hungry man. Do you drink coffee? A little bit? Well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit. How's that? And we have uh, cream. Do you take cream in your coffee? Yes. And we have sugars and uh, uh, artificial sweeteners if you want. Do you drink coffee? Okay. Here you go. And guys, I'm going to give you the freedom to choose any cake here you want. We have a cheese Danish, we have a lemon Danish, we have a raspberry Danish, and we have Cheesecake Factory Cheesecake. What would you like, Larry? Hmm. Hmm, all of them, right? You want the lemon? What would you want, Edgar? You're going to take the cheesecake, and we have... Uh, Spoons here. Here you go, Larry. Take some home too. You take some home. I'm going to entice some of the people from the congregation, but I'll tell you what. Uh, Lynn, do you have some plastic spoons in your bag? You're kidding me. I finally caught you without. Can uh, Pastor Jan, would you go get me some plastic spoons? Who would like to have fellowship with me today? There you go. <laughs> Blessed are the bold. What would you like? Cheesecake, cheesecake. Here we go. There's a piece of cheesecake. And Pastor Jan is going to bring you a spoon so that you can eat it. <laughs> Who else wants to have some fellowship with me? You want some. What would you like? Which one? You, do you want the cheesecake or the cheese Danish? Cheese Danish. She knows what she wants. All right, come on down. This is Amber's mom, right? Come on down. How are you, sweetie? I know I've met you in the past. Tell me your name again. Kendra. Kendra. God bless you. Give me a hug. What would you like? All right. We got a raspberry Danish. Messiah, you want a raspberry Danish? Here we go. Let's pass that down to Messiah. Awesome. Come on, give him a big round of applause. And, and little Messiah up there. Now, let me ask you a question. If I invited you out for a cup of coffee or I invited you out for lunch or for dinner, and then I sat at the table and you, guys, help yourself start eating. Yeah, this is for real. The people in the congregation are eating. If you want to pick it up with your hands, pick it up. We'll just laugh at the, the mess you make. If I invited you out for lunch, I invited you out for a dinner, and then I sat there with you, Paolo, and I didn't talk to you, it would be really awkward. And if I invited you to my house for pizza, like I'm inviting the young adults to come for pizza, and then you came and I didn't make pizza, and I let you sit on my lounge chair for an hour and a half and I never conversed with you, if I did that four or five times, the last time I asked you, would you be inclined to come? Not at all. Not at all. Why? Because that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose. You don't want to be disrespected. You don't want to waste your time. You know where you're welcomed and where you're not. Correct? The Holy Spirit according to the Apostle Paul, has come to have fellowship with us. And kononia is partnership. It's that, uh, let's throw it up there again. Kononia is that partnership, contributory help, participation. Do you know the Holy Spirit wants to have fellowship with you because he wants to be there to help you and contribute to your life on a daily basis. Amen. And so often we're not aware of this important factor. And so we talk to God the Father. We talk to Jesus Christ. But we never give the Holy Spirit any space, any room in our lives. How are you guys doing? Oh, great. Is it good? Mm -hmm. 
Listen, week after week, I tell people they are the best Danishes I've ever had. Isn't that a good Danish? How's the cheesecake? Awesome, right? Sorry? You want a refill? <laughs> you want a refill of the cake, don't you? Yeah. But church, the Holy Spirit often comes and he hangs around our life and we never talk to him. And the same way I said to Paolo, if I keep inviting you over for pizza and I never make pizza and I don't even talk to you, will you keep coming at my invitation? And his answer was no. Do you know that we can actually ignore the Holy Spirit? And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. He has feeling. He has emotion. He, he wants to talk with us. He wants to have relationship with us. And we can grieve him by ignoring him. And so today's message is having coffee with the Holy Spirit. Now listen, you don't just talk to the Holy Spirit at breakfast time. I talk to him every time I'm going into a counseling session and I'm asking him questions. As I'm counseling, I'm asking him questions. I talk to the Holy Spirit while I'm driving down the road and I ask him questions and he answers me. He talks back. How many women here have ever spoken to your husband and he just sat there in silence? I want to introduce you to a partner who will talk back. <laughs> All right? He will answer us. Now, we've looked at what Paul says. Have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. These guys are enjoying the cake. Is that good cheesecake? Is it one of the better ones that you've had? Yeah? All right. Very good. Do you want your money back? You didn't pay for it, so you're not getting anything back. <laughs> Let's have a look at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. You guys can actually, if you want, take your cake with you and keep eating from your seat. Connie's watching you, and she's waiting to see if you're going to offer her any. Oh, <laughs> Somebody's going to need some help from the Holy Spirit very soon. Paul says to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus say? Now, while I've made this a little bit funny and I've made an illustration out of it, I do it so that the picture remains in your mind. And I'm going to ask you, at the end of this message, did you have coffee with the Holy Spirit? You see, church, it's so important. You're going to see in a moment that Jesus actually tells us that the Holy Spirit comes to live with us and have daily involvement in our lives. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready to find out what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Come on, let's have a look. In John chapter 14, verse 15 to 17, this is what Jesus says. If you love me and keep my commands, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you. Stop. Remember we said the word fellowship means contribu contributory help? Here Jesus is saying that he's going to send another advocate and he will help you. So Paul tells us that fellowship with the Holy Spirit means that the Holy Spirit will interact with us and he will be a partner and he will contribute, he will help us. Now Jesus is saying exactly the same thing, that he will send the Holy Spirit and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. How many of you can use... A little bit of extra help in your day-to-day -day life all of us can without a question without a question it is an emphatic statement I can use all the help I can get believe me every day of the week and so Jesus says I'm gonna send you another advocate he he's talking to his disciples Miriam he said guys 
You're so used to me being here. You ask me questions whenever you want. When you're stumped, when you have a problem, some of you have come to me privately about your personal situations. How many of you would imagine that John, Peter, Matthew would have pulled Jesus aside privately and asked him stuff from time to time? Is it fair to imagine that? Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going to give you another advocate. The same way you talk to me, the same way you ask me questions, the same way you look to me for guidance in decision making, I'm going to go, but I'm sending you another advocate. Paul says, have fellowship with the one who wants to be the senior partner in your life and he wants to contribute information to you. Jesus goes on and says, he is, verse 17, the spirit of truth. Everyone look at me. If the Holy Spirit is the the spirit of truth, And he wants to hang around you, and he wants to contribute to you, and he wants to be the senior partner in your life. How many of you want to resist the voice of the Holy Spirit? Anybody? How many of you want to welcome the voice of the Holy Spirit? You see, church, I want you to understand the full word of God, the full counsel of God. I have a relationship with God the Father, and I often look at him, and he is my dad, and I know that he's a good dad. I look at Jesus. He's my older brother. He's my savior. He's my redeemer, and I thank him, and I use the authority he has given me, and I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. But my day-to-day advocate, the one who is going to be with me on a day-to-day basis is the Holy Spirit. And since he's a partner with me, I recognize I'm the minor partner, he's the major partner, and so I'm always deferring to him. Guys, in every situation, if I could let you be inside the mind of Pastor Rob Scarallo, I am constantly asking the Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, show me what the right decision is because you are my advocate today. Somebody give me an amen. Amen. Jesus said another advocate. The word advocate in the Greek is the word parakletos, parakletos, and it means An advocate, what is an advocate? Somebody who speaks on your behalf and always has your best interest at heart. Wow. If the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, he cannot lie. He can never be prejudiced. All right? He's the spirit of truth, and he's going to be my advocate. He has my best interest. Uh, Rocco, right? He has your best interest at heart and he will speak on your behalf. How many of you want to welcome this guy in your life and be on good terms with him? You see, we don't want to ignore him, nor do we want to grieve him. We must treat the Holy Spirit just like we would treat Jesus if Jesus was here in his physical body. Okay? He is the third person of the Godhead, and he is real. He is the spirit of truth, and he comes to help us. It goes on, it says he's an advocate, he's an intercessor. Whoa! We read last week that when we pray in tongues, Gloria, the Holy Spirit, capital S, will intercede with our spirit, little s, and will pray for things that we don't even know in our conscious mind that need to be prayed for. Here the word advocate, parakletos, means he is an intercessor. Church, we don't make up these things. We are seeing from one verse to another verse Paul says, have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm sending you another advocate. Paul says that the Holy Spirit 
intercedes on our behalf with our spirit through tongues and he is interceding and praying for things in our natural minds we don't even know need prayer support. Here in the very word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, he's an intercessor. How many of you want to let the Holy Spirit free in your spirit to start praying prayers you don't know need to be prayed over your life? Come on, give me a wave. Put your hand up. Give me a wave. Listen, welcome the Holy Spirit all the time. Welcome him and say, Holy Spirit, you are the senior partner of my day-to-day -day life, and I welcome you to speak to me, minister to me, and speak in tongues through my spirit and pray prayers that with my natural mind, I don't know I need to pray. I love that. I love that. It says he's a consoler, he's a comforter, he's a helper. Helper. Wow, when we read the word fellowship, uh, konania, it says that he is one who contributes in a helpful way. Here, as an advocate, he is a helper. So we're seeing it from two different Greek words. Konania is partnership with one who contributes to us, and Paul uses that regarding the Holy Spirit. Here, Jesus refers to him as the advocate. He is one who intercedes, and he helps us. That's a good helper to have, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tamika, I love you. You've been in this church for a few years. God's done an amazing work in your life. Would you feel comfortable coming here if I ignored you? No. That was pretty emphatic. She's making sure I know. If I ignored you, if I avoided you, if I never wanted to ever say hello to you, embrace you, or listen to you, if none of these, if these pastors did never wanted to sit with you and talk with you when you wanted help, would you keep coming? No. No. <laughs> I keep coming because everyone has done all those things. They've done all those things. Mm -hmm. Fellowship. Yes. Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Have we been an advocate for you? Yes. Okay. If we don't communicate with the Holy Spirit, we're ignoring him. I don't want the Holy Spirit to feel unwelcomed around Rob Scarello. I don't want the Holy Spirit to feel unwelcome in this church. And church, I want to encourage you, though you may not have heard this taught before, everything I'm reading is straight from Scripture He's meant to be actively engaged in our lives. And we're meant to have relationship with him. Can I get an agreement? Amen. He's an advocate, okay? Um, <clears throat> it, it, in the Greek, it, it comes from two words, para and kletos. And para means one who is close by. The Holy Spirit is always close by. And kletos uh, it means he makes the right call. He is a legal advocate who makes the right judgment call because he's close enough to the situation. Everyone look at me for a moment. Many churches want to tell you that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for today. The sad thing is, what they don't recognize is that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is wisdom. How many of you could use a little dose of supernatural wisdom from time to time? James writes in his letter, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Lord who will give freely. If these gifts are not for the church today, then God wants us to walk around like bumbling idiots. Do you believe that? Absolutely not. Wisdom is a gift of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit who is an advocate and who wants to contribute to your life and he is a senior partner. He wants to give you wisdom beyond your own understanding. 
How many of you would want to be in business and have a senior partner who knew less than you, in fact, knew so much less than you, he was a hindrance? Would you want a senior partner like that? No. But the Holy Spirit is a senior partner who speaks wisdom. Have you ever needed discernment? Have you ever been in a situation where you don't know, should I make this decision or this decision, and everything is hanging on the right decision? That's the time you need discernment, isn't it? Amen. Discernment is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they want to tell us that the Holy Spirit doesn't do that today. The gifts of the Spirit are wisdom, discernment, words of knowledge, healing, miracles, prophecy, a message in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. But wisdom, discernment, and a word of knowledge, information that you receive from the Spirit and not from your five senses. They want to say, that's not for today. They want to cut the Holy Spirit down to half the person he is. If I came to your house or had friend, a fellowship with you, if I was a friend and you're always cutting me down and talking to me less than who I am, do you think that I would keep allowing myself to be abused like that? And nor should you. But why do we abuse the Holy Spirit and say, no, well, he doesn't operate like that anymore. You cannot separate the power of the Spirit from who the Holy Spirit is. The same way he brings the character of God, he brings the gifts of wisdom, of knowledge, of prophetic ability. He brings the gifts of healing, and he brings the gift of miracles. If you believe that, let the Holy Spirit know you believe it, and give me an amen. Amen. Absolutely. Without a question, undoubtedly, <laughs> He is close enough, he is para, he is close enough to make the right call. In other words, as the advocate, paracletos, he is living inside of you, and when you need a discernment, he can give you discernment so that you make the right call. He could give you wisdom. You know, discernment and wisdom are two different things. <clears throat> you could get discernment. You know, when I was, uh, my kids were younger, sometimes they would tell me tales. I would ask them a question and they know they're about to get in trouble because they did something they weren't supposed to do and they give you a little fib. <laughs> Any, yeah. Anybody ever fib? We all fib, Right? And they give you a little fib, and there's something inside of you that knows they're not telling the truth. But it's not just with little kids. Sometimes that's more obvious. But even in life, sometimes we're dealing with another person, and we know they are not telling the truth. And the Holy Spirit will give you discernment. Here's the issue. Once I have discernment, what do I do? Wisdom and discernment flow together because once God gives you the discernment of what's really going on, people are lying to you, they're being deceitful, they're being manipulative, the Holy Spirit will give you discernment, but then we could react in the flesh and get angry or say things that would not be wise. The Holy Spirit will also give you wisdom so that we take the discernment he gives us and we respond in a supernaturally wise way. Amen. Has anyone ever put their foot in their mouth? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Holy Spirit never puts his foot in his mouth. He will give you discernment and he will give you wisdom on how to handle that. Isn't it a shame that some people want to say those gifts aren't for today? Yeah. And yet... This is who the Holy Spirit is. He will give you supernatural discernment and he will give you supernatural wisdom to know how to act and how to respond. Give me a wave if you want the Holy Spirit. 
to give you discernment and wisdom. Absolutely. There are enough hands waving. We don't have to turn the fans on. All right. The second thing Jesus said is that he is the spirit of truth. He's not the spirit of exaggeration. He's not the spirit of lies. He's not the spirit of deception. He's the spirit of truth. Now that might not seem like a whole big deal on its own, but let's examine this for a moment. Let's examine why it is important to have the spirit of truth around our lives. We're going to put it up on the screen. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, he's being the spirit of truth. Every one of us have struggled with wrong desires and wrong attitudes and wrong thoughts. And here's the one thing that is universally true of sin. It will always try to make a justification as to why it's okay. And the more we believe the lie and we justify our attitude or we justify our behavior, we allow sin to speak on its own behalf and we come up with excuses why my behavior is okay and it's acceptable. But if I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and he's the spirit of truth, he's going to come and convict me. In other words, he's going to start peeling away the lies from the enemy, the lies that keep me trapped in sin, feeling comfortable. I'm okay, you're okay, everything's okay. And the Holy Spirit starts to pull away the lies so that he can deal with with the sin issue in our heart. How many of you want the Holy Spirit? Come on, he's the spirit of truth. Sometimes it's not a matter of sin. We've been taught things that are wrong, incorrect, and we're living under a misguided notion. We are living under a lie or a delusion. How many of you have ever believed something wholeheartedly and as you've grown and as you've had encounters with life have found out that everything you believed was incorrect and it actually robbed you and stole from you? How many of you have ever had an experience like that? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And what he does is he will take the spirit of deception and the things we were taught that were wrong and slowly he will start to peel them away. Why? The spirit of truth is always in agreement with the mind of God. And if you build a relationship with the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth, he will keep peeling away from your mindset everything that doesn't agree with the mind of God. He will reposition you so that you are in divine order and you are thinking the way your Father in heaven thinks. If that was the only thing the Holy Spirit did, isn't he worth having around? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Unequivocally, for sure. When the Holy Spirit corrects us, he's being the spirit of truth. I need the Holy Spirit to correct me. You need the Holy Spirit to correct you. And when he speaks inside of us, if we don't ignore him, but we give him access to our thoughts. When the Holy Spirit speaks, sometimes our brain tries to shut him down. But being full of the Spirit means we're going to shut this down and we're going to listen to the Spirit of God. Amen. Hello? If we keep shutting him down when he speaks to us, he won't speak. But if the Holy Spirit sees that when he talks to you and your mind wants to argue and you shut your mind down and you trust him, how many of you think that will encourage the Holy Spirit to talk to you more often? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. When the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of discernment, he's being the spirit of truth. When he gives us a word of knowledge, information that your five senses didn't pick up but you in your gut in here you just know 
When the Holy Spirit gives us a word of knowledge, he's being the spirit of truth. When the word of Holy Spirit gives us a word of wisdom, he's being the spirit of truth. How many of you think it's valuable to have the spirit of truth around your life? Yes. Number three. Number three. Let me look at this here. In verse uh, 17, Jesus says, The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him, neither does it see him, neither does it know him. Everyone look at me. In the church, we know the term the Holy Spirit. We know of the Holy Spirit. But I can honestly tell you, too often in the church, we don't know him. We know about him. The Holy Spirit wants you to know him through fellowship. He wants to sit with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants you to ask him questions. He's the senior partner. I ask him all the time. In every area of my life, in every area of my life, I talk to the Holy Spirit. Not just church stuff. For me, as a man, I ask him questions. I talk to him. Because he's meant to be an advocate, the parakletos, the one who will give me discernment, the one who will give me words of knowledge, etc., etc. But here in verse 17, the world cannot accept him, neither does it see him or know him. You know him. Now Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus is referring to the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit went from being with them to being the Spirit who lives inside of them. Prior to Pentecost, prior to Jesus dying on the cross, men held on by faith to the token of the blood of bulls and goats. But after Jesus died, he took his blood, his redemptive blood, into the inner courts of heaven and he washed away the sins of every human being. For the first time in human history, now the Holy Spirit, who was with the prophets, he was with them, he was on them, now he came into them and for the first time, the Spirit of God lived inside of humanity. Amen. I want the Holy Spirit not to just hang around me. I want him inside of me. Can I get an agreement? Absolutely. John, yeah, give the Lord a hand. Go on, give the Lord a hand. In John 14, Jesus goes on. This is a conversation he's having in the upper room when he's having the last supper with his disciples. They had already broken bread. They already drank the wine. And he's talking to them. He says, all this I have spoken while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Jesus is trading off. He's saying, guys, I've been with you. I've been your mentor. I've been your counselor. I've been your confidant. You pull me aside. You ask me questions. I tell you the truth. But I'm going to go. I'm trading off places with the Holy Spirit. And he's the one that is your go-to. He's the one that will counsel you. He's the one that will advise you. He's the one that will give you supernatural insight. When he comes, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said. And before, he will teach you all things. Is there anyone in this house that has room for a little bit more understanding? All right. If you didn't, God needs to teach you something right now. If you didn't, raise your hand. Number five, he will remind you of everything that Jesus said. Do you know the Holy Spirit has this wonderful ability that just as I'm about to react in my flesh and make a decision of 
maybe reacting, maybe being annoyed, maybe making a judgment about a situation, and suddenly he will bring the perfect verse to my mind, and it changes my actions. The Holy Spirit is the one who will bring things to your remembrance that Jesus said. I don't know about you, but I'm glad he does that to me. John 15, verse 26 to 27. Again, Jesus is still talking to the disciples right after communion, right after Passover. And he says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, he goes out from my Father, he will testify about me. You also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Now, I know Jesus is talking to his disciples, but this is the word of God, and it was compiled by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, you and I must testify of him. And what he's saying is the Holy Spirit, when you start to talk to people about this new relationship you have with Jesus, have you learned much, much more since you've been coming here? Has your relationship with Jesus become more exciting? And what Jesus is saying is, the Holy Spirit will testify of me. In other words, when you start talking to family, you start talking to friends and they think you're in a cult, you're in a crazy religion, you go to church so often, you get so emotional, the Holy Spirit will help you testify or give evidence about Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and you will be witnesses of me in Judea, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit, the same way he testifies about Jesus, he will tell you what to say. He will bring things to your mind. People will ask you questions. We get so afraid. We don't testify because ah, I don't know what to say. The devil wants you to be bound up in fear. Jesus wants you to tell it on the mountain. Jesus wants you to tell your friends. He wants you to engage people and have confidence that the Holy Spirit who is inside of you will start to give you things to say and things that will touch the other person's heart. Yeah, watch this. I know many of you will be able to agree and testify that you've had an experience like this. Have you ever talked to a friend? You didn't know where they were at. You didn't know what was going on. And as you're talking to them about the Lord, they start to weep. And afterwards, you find out that you were hitting things, you were speaking things that were meeting and answering questions in their, their heart, and you were addressing things that they were going through right then and there, and you had no idea. How many of you have ever had an encounter like that? Look around the room. Keep your hands up. Come on. Keep your hands up. Look around the room. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The same way he will pray prayers that your brain doesn't know to pray and he's accurate every time. I pray in tongues because he is accurate every time. When you're talking with people, he will bring things out of your mouth in English that your head didn't know was the very issue that person is going through. And you know what that does? The Spirit is testifying of the greatness of God. Okay, come on, give the Lord a hand. Absolutely. John 16, verse 7, Jesus says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Look at me, everybody. From when I was a little kid, I was taught about Jesus and I fell in love with Jesus. And in my childlike mind, I could never imagine that it was to my advantage that Jesus left. I mean, if I did not understand who the Holy Spirit is 
and what he can do in our lives even today. If I didn't understand that, I would think to myself, man, I wish I could have a face-to-face talk with Jesus. How many of you have ever said to yourself, I wish Jesus would show up and I could have a face-to-face talk with him? And you know what Jesus' answer is? It's to your advantage that I go. Because while I'm on earth, I am in the form of one man. I came as the last Adam. I am restricted by a human physical presence. But it's to your advantage, Peter, Matthew, John. It is to your advantage, Joan, Lynn, Connie. It is to your advantage that I go because when I go, the Spirit of God can be in every believer anywhere around the world at the same time and he will be your personal guide, your personal instructor. He will give you discernment. He will give you wisdom. He will give you words of knowledge and he will direct you and help you. Everybody repeat after me, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I need you. I want you. Amen. He's meant to have a day-to-day relationship with you. We, We already read the fact that Jesus said it's to your advantage that I go away if I go the advo- if unless I go away the advocate will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you you know if Jesus was here physically on earth you'd have to travel around the world to have an appearance with him and you'd have to fight through crowds of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people But the same spirit who gave Jesus words of wisdom, the same spirit that flowed through Jesus and healed people, the same spirit that gave Jesus discernment, the same spirit that gave Jesus wisdom when he's dealing with the Pharisees, the same spirit that prophesied and let Jesus know what people were planning and plotting against him, the same spirit that tutored Jesus Christ is the spirit that's made available to each and every one of us. It is the Holy Spirit of God. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. He is meant, number seven, to have a day-to-day relationship with you. In John chapter 16, Jesus said, I've got so much more to tell you, more than you can break down at the moment. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Stop. Stop. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will tell you what is yet to come. You know what that is? He's going to tell you things in the future that are yet to happen. That's prophecy. It is a natural part of the Holy Spirit to prophesy. And some people want to tell you the Holy Spirit doesn't do that anymore. They want to cut him down to half the person he is. And they say, that's not for today. Jesus said that is for today. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and he will prophesy. He will give you a heads up. He will tell you things that are yet to come. How many of you have ever been driving down the road and suddenly everything's normal, but you get the sense, slow down. Slow down for a minute. And you slow down and all of a sudden a car comes through the intersection or something like that and you realize, whoa, if I didn't listen, I would have been in an accident. Who's ever had an experience like that? You know what that is? God telling you, the Holy Ghost telling you what is yet to come. That is another function of the prophetic spirit of Jesus Christ. 
And if we don't have coffee with him, we don't take time to sit down and converse with him, he'll actually be grieved. He'll be offended. He'll recognize he's not welcomed. And when you need that little voice that's going to give you a heads up because trouble is around the corner, you won't be accustomed to hearing it because you always listen to your five senses and your brain and you've never allowed your spirit to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The thief comes to steal. He wants to rob you of the experience and the relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit not only brings the character of God and redefines you and starts to put the character of God in you, he will also come with the supernatural abilities of God. He will forewarn you. He will give you a heads up. He will prophesy and make you aware of things so that your life is protected. Turn to somebody and say, man, this is good preaching. I need this. Come on, say it. I need this. Now say to the Holy Spirit, I want you. You asked Jesus in your heart about four months ago, maybe a little bit more. Can I ask you an honest question? Since you've asked Jesus in your heart, has your life started to change? Would you say that some of your character traits have started to lessen and some good character traits of God have started to come in? In the same way the Holy Spirit does that, he wants to bring the spiritual abilities of God around our lives. Don't let wrong theology block the Holy Spirit from moving in your life. Church, the whole reason for the baptism in the Holy Spirit is because God wants us to go from living here to living here, listening to the Spirit of God. Amen. Look, I have an excellent brain. I have an imaginative mind. It is very, very good, and it has helped me many times. But that same imagination has also gotten me into trouble. That imagination at times has been used in the area of fear and it has paralyzed me so that I've not made a decision that I needed to make and it's kept me stuck in the same mentality year after year. This same imaginative mind that has benefited me has also drawn imaginations and played with my emotions and said, uh, Lynn thinks this and this about you, and Lynn has been spreading rumors around the church about you, and she smiles to your face, but she doesn't really like you, and she is working the, the, uh, the congregation to be against you. My imagination has spoken to me through the spirit of rejection, and for years it has made me suspicious of people who weren't against me. The thief comes to rob, the thief comes to steal, the thief comes to kill, but the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So even though my mind has helped me and it's been very, very uh, uh, impactful at times, it has also been destructive in my life. In fact, I could tell you unequivocally on video, on live stream, that every stupid mistake I have ever made has come from my mind. But the best decisions I make come from the Holy Spirit talking to my spirit and my spirit says to my mind, no, 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 no. I'm not going to say that. Yep. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to act like that. When we learn to listen to the Spirit of God and put our brain on hold, it is the beginning of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, and be the senior partner. Amen. 
And this is what Jesus is talking about. I want you to have relationship with the Holy Spirit. He will be your advocate. He will represent you. He will always look after, Timothy, your best interest. And so church, while we had a little bit of fun here and a few people gained a pound or two (laughs) eating some sweet cakes, the illustration is As it is in the natural, we sit down and we have fellowship, we have relationship. I want to remind you, I want to ask you a question, and I want this question to go through your mind every day. Did you have coffee with the Holy Spirit today? You see, by setting up this table, I don't mean just at breakfast time. Because all through the day, morning, Afternoon, early evening, and late at night, I am constantly asking the Holy Spirit for wisdom, discernment. I'm asking him for words of knowledge. I'm asking him for fruit of character so that I don't act like the old Rob Scarallo. I act like the new Rob Scarallo who looks like Jesus. Come on. How many of you want to pray that over your husband? How many of you want to pray that over your wife? How many of you want to pray that over yourself? I say those other things in jest. We need to look to ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to address us and redress us. Can I get an amen? Amen. Absolutely. Has this been a good teaching? Is this helpful? As I close, I want to show you something. I'm going to show you the mechanics of the Holy Spirit. I often talk to you and teach you principles. And I tell you, if you learn the principles of God, there are natural principles, but there are spiritual principles. And if I teach you the spiritual principles of God, you won't just live a natural life, you will live a supernatural life. How many of you want to live a supernatural life? David wrote in his Psalms and he wrote about Moses and he said, the children of Israel saw the acts of God. They saw the miracles. But Moses learned the ways of God. You see, if you learn the ways of God, you'll have the keys to unlock the acts of God. So let me ask you, Do you want to see the acts of God or do you want to learn the ways of God? Absolutely. If we were to put this strictly in a um, uh, fable as an example, would you rather have a golden egg or would you rather have the goose that lays a golden egg every day? I love seeing miracles. I love seeing the power of God. I love seeing how the Holy Ghost comes and transforms a person. But I don't want to just see it. He's looking for partners. He's the senior partner. I want to learn the supernatural principles of how God works so that I could help unlock miracles in people's lives on a regular basis. How many of you want to unlock God's blessing and God's miracles in your own life. So I want to show you the mechanics. I want to show you a principle, okay? We read scripture and sometimes we read it like with a religious brain and we just quote it and we don't break it down and say, well, what does that mean? How does that actually work? So Jesus says here, listen to this. John 16, he says, Uh, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into truth. Now listen, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit, capital S, will receive from me what he will make known to you. Paul tells us how this works. In 1 Corinthians, and I read this to you last week, I want you to understand how the operation of the Spirit functions. How many of you want to flow more freely with the Holy Spirit? Okay, I'm going to show you how things work so that you could visualize it, so that you could understand it, so that you don't interrupt the process. Many times the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to us and fear interrupts the process. Or naysaying. We hear other people tell us, yeah, that doesn't happen. Now, nah, what do you think? You're special. God's not going to talk to you. And we allow the expressions of doubt. We allow the expressions of religious misteachings in other people affect us. And it stops the process of the Holy Spirit of God talking to us. So I'm going to show you the mechanism, the mechanics, the principle of how the Holy Spirit talks to us and how he gives us a word of discernment, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Watch. Paul explains it like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, The Spirit, capital S, who, whose Spirit is that? Right? That's the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit searches all things. Even the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit gets up into God's heart and into his head. And he knows everything that is in God's mind. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? Everyone look at Lynn for a moment. Come on, look at Lynn. This is Lynn. Thank you. One person wants to have fellowship with her. Everybody. As you're looking at Lynn, you don't know what she's thinking. In fact, if you have a relationship with Lynn, you have an idea of what she's about. But there are inner, deep, recessed thoughts and attitudes, hopes and dreams hidden inside of her mind that she's not shared with anyone. Do you know what's in her head? Do you know what's deep down in her heart? What Paul is saying, the spirit of a man, the spirit of a woman knows everything about that person. They know every hurt and trauma you've ever experienced that now you've forgotten. Your brain decided to delete it but it still triggers you and you don't know why you get triggered and the Holy Spirit knows everything inside of you. Who knows the mind of a man except for the spirit of that person? Can we all agree that that makes sense? Yes. And so Paul says, the spirit of God searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit, little less, within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, capital S. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is, who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit won't speak on his own. He won't tell you what he thinks. He's going to tell you what God thinks. I want to hear the Holy Spirit. I have natural ears. And my natural ears hear well. But you also have spiritual ears. I want to turn up the volume on my spiritual ears. I want to hear from the Spirit of God. Come on. I have natural eyes. And sometimes what we see can be deceptive. We can see something and come to certain conclusions, but those conclusions are in error. I don't want to rely just on my 
natural ability to see. I want to see things in the Spirit. I want the Holy Ghost to show me things that my natural eye would never see. And so Jesus is echoing, or Jesus is saying, and Paul is echoing what Jesus said. Jesus said the Holy Spirit won't just come and and just talk nonsense with you. He will search my mind. I and the Father are one. He will search my mind. He will search my heart. And he will reveal things to you from my mind. Wow. Paul picks that up and he tells us the same thing. How do I get a word of wisdom? I have to believe that the Holy Spirit is real. He's present. He searches the mind of God. And as I'm having interaction with life, as I'm having interaction, relationship with people, I have to believe that the Spirit of God will search the mind of God and he'll talk to my spirit and he'll say, Rob, what this person is saying to you is not the truth. They're trying to deceive you. They're being deceptive. They want to take advantage of you. And my natural mind says, oh, no, no, look. Look at their emotions. I could see it on their face. They're being honest. And the Spirit is saying, no, don't agree. Don't agree. And that's where you and I, if we understand the mechanism, if we understand the principle, the Holy Spirit is going to look out for you. And the Holy Spirit will talk to you. And he will search the mind of God and he will speak to your spirit. Sometimes we need to put our natural mind on hold and learn how to hear the Holy Spirit talking to our spirit. Can I get an agreement? Yeah, give the Lord a clap. Go on. Give the Lord a clap. Number eight, he will guide you in all truths. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will search the mind of the Son of God and he will reveal secrets to you. He will give you discernment. He will give you wisdom. He will give you words of knowledge. You could be in a relationship with someone. Here's Joan. You know, at times God will tell us things about people we love She's feeling really burdened and heavy, and this and this is going on in her life, and she might never voice it, but when I voice it, all of a sudden she knows God is reading my mail, God cares about me, God spoke to someone to speak to me, and she breaks down crying, and we lay hands on her, and God starts to lift the burden off of her heart. How many of you want to have that type of relationship with the Holy Spirit? The beauty of praying in tongues is that aside from the fact that the Holy Spirit prays through you, it is a great exercise to put your brain on hold and allow your spirit to have freedom to talk to your spirit and talk to God. And so Paul says, I'm glad I pray in tongues more than you all. I've learned as much as my mind is bright and it's sharp, it's not always right. And I've learned as I pray in tongues, I put my questioning mind, my doubting mind, I put my arrogant mind on hold and I allow the Holy Spirit to pray with my spirit through tongues that I've never learned And I just trust God by faith that I am now communicating spirit to spirit. Amen. Is this making sense? Absolutely. The involvement of the Holy Spirit in our life is to our greatest advantage. Would you stand with me? I use the illustration of coffee and cheesecake and danishes. But look at me. Look at me. I want you to ask yourself this question on a regular basis. Everyone, look at me. 
Did you have coffee with the Holy Spirit today? And I'm not just talking about at breakfast. That is just an illustration. Did you talk to him in the morning? Did you talk to him before noon? Did you talk to him after noon? Did you talk to him early in the evening? Do you talk to him when you lay your head down on the pillow? I have found that the more I respect him and have fellowship with him, the more my spirit becomes sensitive to his voice. And the more I allow that to happen, the less my brain tries to interfere and sabotage me. You all know, everyone here, if you've been saved even six months, you know that sometimes you hear something here and your brain's going, nah, 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 nah. And the enemy will use our brain to sabotage the voice of the Spirit of God. He doesn't speak on his own. If the Holy Spirit is speaking, God has something he wants you to know. And so I find it so important, whether you're watching on live stream today or you see this on YouTube in 10 years' time, it is important for the body of Christ to start to learn to live from our spirit so that we don't reason and argue from our brain but we start to hear the Spirit of God telling us things that our natural brain doesn't know. Isn't it sad that some of the church have actually created a doctrine that will tell you that's not for today? You know what? I need the voice of God through the Holy Spirit talking to me every day. So don't say it's not for today. It's for every day. Can I get an agreement here? Amen. Amen. As you're all standing, I want to encourage you to talk to him. Welcome the Holy Spirit. If you've not received a prayer language yet, oh, it is so good to have the Holy Spirit praying through your spirit for things, Miriam, you never even thought about. Do you know, at times, I have buttons just like you have buttons, and things get triggered. And throughout my life, as things repeatedly, the same thing gets triggered over and over again, I've stopped and I said, okay, Holy Spirit, why do I react? What is it? And so many times the Holy Spirit suddenly will bring a memory from the past to my mind. And he shows me how I got wounded and how I took offense. And I have repented and said, I'm so sorry, I see it. There was an issue of fear. I, I, I was a 14-year-old teenager who wants to look cool. And this is a, sounds like a silly nothing thing, but this is a principle. I, I would see a spider. I lived in Australia. We have tons of spiders. And the moment I'd see a spider, my whole body would go into a shivers like that. Not cool for a 14-year-old girl, a guy when he's trying to make moves on a girl. But aside from that, it bothered me. Why should I be so fearful of a spider on the wall that my whole body would go into shivers? And... That w it would happen anywhere, and it would happen all the time. You'd think I'd get used to it. And as a 14-year-old, I said, Holy Spirit, why? Why does the spirit of fear, you've already delivered me of fear, why is that the image of a spider will trigger me, and I will literally start shaking? And he brought before me a picture of my mom and me, and I was in a stroller, and my mother reacted in fear to an insect, and I took her fear. I saw the object, and I took her fear, and it left an impression in me. And the moment I saw it, I said, Father, thank you for that vision, that picture you gave me from my past. I'm sorry I was fearful, 
I was just a kid. I rebuke that spirit of fear, the fear of spiders. I rebuke it. How dare it have control over my mind and my emotions? Mentally, I wasn't aware. It was hidden in my childhood. But the Holy Spirit brought that information up. I rebuke it, and I swear to you before my Father today that from that moment on, I have never had a reaction like that to spiders. In fact, after that, I'd wake up in my bed, this is in Australia, and there'd be a spider on my arm, and I'd wake up and say, oh, it's just you, and I'd shake it off. But as much as that may seem like an insignificant thing, what is significant is the principle. What triggers you into anger? What triggers you into blind rage? What triggers you into jealousy or insecurity? What triggers you? The Holy Spirit wants to use the gifts of God. And He will search the mind of God and bring pictures to your spirit and then bring them to your mind. And God will show you the moment of trauma or the vow that you made. No one will ever do that to me. And it sets up a reaction inside of you. And you never saw the wires connecting to that moment and that image of trauma. And God wants to set you free from reactive behavior that doesn't line up with the character of Jesus Christ. How many of you can say this is good preaching? We need to hear this, don't we? We need to hear this. And so I've allowed the Holy Spirit to be my personal counselor. I talk to him often. And where there are unfinished things in my life that are not refined, I ask him, pinpoint it. Help me to see it. Because I want to act and deal with it in Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit wants to be your best friend. Invite him into your life. If you've never received a prayer language, believe for it. Ask one of the pastors to pray with you, and they will help you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we close here this morning, if you have never asked Jesus Christ in your heart, that's where it all begins. Before the Holy Spirit comes a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the first advocate. Maybe you've gone to church. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about letting Jesus live inside of you. If you have never asked Jesus to live inside of you, every eye closed right now. I really wish people wouldn't move at the moment. This is a moment. Church, please know this. When we're making an altar call, people have the opportunity to accept eternal life. This is the one time everyone, the one moment everyone should be still. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, with every eye closed, just raise your hand and say, I want Jesus. I want to accept Jesus in my life. Come on, lift your hand if that's you. You've never accepted Christ. I see that hand up the back. Thank you, young lady. You can put it down. God bless you. Who else would like to accept Christ into their life today? Someone over here? Raise a hand. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. That young lady and the whole church, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Jesus. I believe you are God. And you died on that cross for me. I accept you. I receive you. I want you. Live in me. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them with your blood. I thank you, Jesus. That as I receive you now, you come into my life and we will start a relationship. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you as well. Live with me 
and have freedom in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, how many of you learned something today? How many of you feel challenged to start building a talking relationship with the Holy Spirit? Do it. Do it. Honestly, do it. These are some of the hidden truths of the Word of God. They should be preached more often, but people get embarrassed of the Holy Spirit. You know what? The Holy Spirit doesn't get embarrassed of my gaffes and my goofs and all of my mistakes. In the same way I won't be embarrassed of Jesus, I'm not going to be embarrassed of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Expect the Holy Spirit to be supernatural in your life. You know, Jesus came in a physical body. The Holy Spirit didn't come in a physical body. He is supernatural. And if you're going to have a relationship with someone who is purely supernatural, expect supernatural things to happen. Amen. Turn around, give someone a hug, a high five, greet each other. God bless you. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.